We welcome Jennifer Jacobs, who's moved from the political fields of Iowa and the Des Moines Register to join the team at Bloomberg News here in Washington. Jamel Bowie writes for Slate Magazine and is a CBS News political analyst. Dan Balls is chief correspondent for the Washington Post. And Ramesh Panuru is a senior editor for the National Review. Dan, I want to start with you. What's the state of play in the Democratic contest? Well, the state of play is this, that Bernie Sanders has momentum and Hillary Clinton has mathematics. And right now, momentum is prevailing, at least in the narrative of the campaign. And so there's a lot of focus on, A, how is Sanders able to continue to, in a sense, perform better than anybody expected? I mean, he's run a remarkable campaign by, by any measure. And yet, the delegate, the hard math of the delegates is, continues to be in Clinton's favor. New York is very important to her. Uh, it, it begins a period in which she will be able, she hopes, by the end of this month, to be able to basically say there is no way he can become the nominee. Uh, and in a sense, give her a kind of a permission slip, not simply to compete for the final delegates in the nomination, but to turn her attention a bit to the general yeah, election. Yeah, to finally make that pivot. Right. Jennifer, I was talking to somebody this week and said, you know, unless Bernie Sanders forces a major shift, uh, in the campaign that there's really, even if he continues doing well, he's just not going to be able to do well enough. Is right. that right? Bernie Sanders is just running out of real estate. And just the fact that, um, you know, she tied him in delegates in Wyoming, even though he won, is just, it demonstrates how rough this road is going to be for him. And she's done that repeatedly. There have been many states where they tied or sh he beat her and then she got almost as many delegates or if not more. So it's just, it's going to be a rough road for him. And it just seems like she is the presumptive nominee unless there's a major game changer. And Jamel, did we, this week it got a little contentious. Bernie Sanders said she wasn't qualified. There was a lot of back and forth on that. It seemed maybe like they're both just ragged and tired from this process. <laughs> but where do you get the sense of things? I mean, are there starting to be ir irrevocable things said in this contest? Have they stepped back from the, the, the hottest part of this race? I mean, I think, I think they're attempting to step back in your interview with Senator Sanders. He sort of kind of went on the unqualified riff a little bit, but then caught himself with head. But of course, I think she would be a fine president of the United States if she were the nominee. I think it's worth noting, right, that in 2008, around this time, something like half of Clinton supporters said they wouldn't vote for Obama in the general. So even though things seem uh, contentious and sharp right now, once we get to the convention, uh, regardless of the nominee, I think the Democratic Party is going to pretty quickly unify, um, just just sensing an ability to hold on to the White House and, and win uh, quite a bit more seats in both chambers of Congress that I don't think anyone imagined was possible six months ago. And so that, that fact that winning is really on the table here in a big way, I think it's going to be the force that really pushes everyone to unify. Mm -hmm. How happy would Reince Priebus be if the worst thing Republicans were saying about each other is that they're not qualified? <laughs> I mean, we keep talking about how contentious this debate on the Democratic side is, but it's really almost comically restrained right. in the context of what's going on in 2016. What um, you have not seen from Sanders is an attack on Clinton on the basis that she's not honest and trustworthy which is this line of attack that would potentially be fruitful because there are only a minority of Americans who believe that she's honest and trustworthy, but one that would give the Republicans something serious they could use in a general election. So far, he hasn't done that. Yeah, that's right. Dan, do you think it would, in terms of Bernie Sanders, is, did he sort of step by talking about qualifications? He has, he's had a good run. Did he give a gift to the Clinton campaign by talking about that? It seemed to uh, get him off track this week. Well, I do. I think it. I think it hurt him in this way. He had a big victory in Wisconsin. Uh, he headed into a two-week period ahead of the New York primary with some wind at his back, and yet all of a sudden he got caught up in uh, a debate that did him no favors. And I think that uh, I think that a lot of Democrats believe that he lost that week a week that he needed to keep the momentum going. So I think it was, I think it was a misstep on his part. Uh, in a sense, he kind of took the bait from the Clinton campaign and, and escalated beyond what it needed to be. And I was struck again in the interview that he did with you that he can't quite let go of it. He knows he ought to. Uh, they seem to pivot out of it late last week, and yet again today he's kind of repeating some of the same lines. So I don't think it was helpful, and he's got to kind of regain the momentum that he had a week ago. 
Jennifer, does it matter that he had a, that Bernie Sanders had a bad interview on the specifics with the New York Daily News to his voters? Yeah, I think it did. Actually, one Democrat pointed out to me that it seems like Bernie Sanders is earning more Pinocchios from the Washington Post fact checkers these days than he's earning delegates. And the thing about, you know, she said, quote unquote, that I'm, uh, you know, unqualified was one of the things where he was fact checked as, as false. And there have been several other things. She didn't actually say she that. She did not actually say right. he is not qualified. And there have been other things that, you know, he has been fact checked on lately that, you know, are, are permeating into that, you know, into the consciousness and people are realizing that he doesn't always get his facts exactly right. You know, I'm, I'm a conservative, but I want to defend the socialist here. And th I think there have been a lot of cheap shots about that Daily News interview. You know, when, when Senator Sanders says we're going to put a cap on the size of the banks and it'll be up to them to figure out how they meet that cap, that's a totally legitimate answer. That's the way a cap on bank size would work. And it's just silly for people to say, oh, well, why isn't he actually spelling out in detail what they're going to have to do? Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree there. Like if you, reading that interview, Sanders has a clear idea of the kinds of policies he would want to pursue. He knows that laws like Dodd-Frank give the White House quite a bit of authority in determining how to pursue bank regulation. The fact that he can't give you chapter and verse, I think is less important than the fact that he does have um, a broad sense of what his administration would do to approach these questions. And, and, what he's, and what he's got that has been effective is he has a diagnosis of what he thinks the problems in the country are and, and, and the, the basis from which that, that occurs and a set of policies that are designed out of that diagnosis. She has, she has a different one. She has a series of answers for specific problems, but that's a different thing than the kind of the theory of the case. And I think it's one of the reasons his message has been more succinct and therefore probably more effective than hers. What she's got is, you know, everything that the Clintons bring to the table. Which his is, campaign is on fire. If he had been this strong before the Iowa caucuses that early on, he would be the nominee now. But there's another aspect to this, which is, which is what nobody quite likes to talk about, and that's the superdelegates. I mean, she has a we know she has a big lead in superdelegates. Uh, they have more superdelegates than they have announced. I mean, they have, they have in the neighborhood of, of 600 superdelegates pledged to them, many of whom are not prepared to publicly say that yet. Um, and, um, you know, if, she, if he doesn't have a majority of pledged delegates, there's no way those superdelegates are going to switch. Are going to switch over, which is his theory. Okay, let's uh, hold it there. We'll get back to the Republicans. But for right now, we're going to just take a little break. Stay with us. We're back now with our panel. Jennifer, where do things stand on the Republican side of the race? Well, Ted Cruz is getting a reputation for outfoxing Donald Trump um, in that hand-to-hand -hand delegate combat. So yesterday in Colorado, he swept up all of the available delegates there, now has 34 from Colorado. Iowa did the same thing. His people managed to squeeze themselves into all but one delegate slot in Iowa. And so he, he really is, is, is just running circles around Do um, Donald Trump in this particular case. Now, obviously, this won't matter if Trump gets to the necessary number before the convention and they know that they're going to have trouble in a few of the upcoming contests. They know that uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, Montana, possibly Washington State and Oregon are going to be trouble for them, but they trouble do... Trouble for Trump. Trouble for Trump. Right. Yes, sorry. But they, the Trump people do think that they're going to do well in almost all the other states, and that includes California and Indiana, and if they do, all of this delegate wrangling that Trump, or that, that Ted Cruz is doing won't matter as much. Now, Trump is complaining that he thinks that this process is tilted, it seems like he's been more focused on the states that he's winning than, you know, how you actually technically win. Um, but he's he is listening to the fact that, you know, he needs to do more. I have heard he is sending a crew down to the RNCs, the Republican National Committee's spring meeting in Florida in 10 days, and their whole mission is to meet the, the uh, RNC members from the various states, really work on building relationships and, and telling, you know, sending the message that they really want to work with the party officials. Ramesh, I want to ask you, Donald Trump has been tweeting on this question of fairness. Um, he wrote a tweet that said, isn't it a shame that the person who will have by far the most delegates and many millions more votes than anyone else, me, still must fight? He's making this case on fairness grounds. Forget the math, forget 1,237. He's just got more, shouldn't it go to him? How potent do you think that argument is? 
Well, look, if he gets a majority of the vote and a majority of the delegates, he is going to be the nominee. And I don't think that the concept of majority rule is all that difficult or arcane uh, for people to understand. What if he just gets the plurality, though? He doesn't have the majority. It's an open convention. He's trying to say even that, since he'll have most of the delegates, that would be unfair if he didn't get it. He can try to make that argument, and maybe it'll sway some of the delegates, but I suspect it won't. I think he's got to do three things. One, get as many bound delegates as he can through the voting. Second, actually compete in this delegate selection process where so far Senator Cruz's people have been the only people showing up to the interview in a suit and a tie. <laughs> and then third, he's got to actually organize an effort to sway supporters of other candidates on a second ballot, which you've heard almost nothing from, from the Trump campaign. Those are three very difficult things to do. If they had been trying to organize two months ago along those lines, they'd probably have this nomination wrapped up, but they are getting to it very late. Dan, so, you go ahead. Oh, I think Rebecca's is right that Trump's, you know, I have the most argument may not sway actual delegates, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't ignore the extent to which actual regular voters may find the entire process unfair if the person who won the most of everything but not quite the technical majority didn't get the, get the nomination. Just because the expectation voters have when going to these polls is not that some arcane process will determine the nominee, but the guy who won will determine the nominee. And so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, put aside, because that's potentially very important. John, I, I uh, sat down Friday evening in New York with Paul Manafort, who has been tasked by Donald Trump to be the convention manager and, in a sense, to be in charge of now the whole process of accumulating the delegates. They're clearly in the middle of a transition in that campaign. They have been, as Jennifer said, they have been outfoxed, out circled, outrun by the Cruz campaign in all of these organizing things. I think the challenge ahead for them uh, is, can they now get their act together in this kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat? Uh, but Manafort said, uh, and you know, he's laid down a marker, that they will be able to accumulate enough delegates so that it is clear he is going to be the nominee before Cleveland. And he said, by mid-May, I hope we are, in a sense, the presumptive nominee. So they have set a very high bar for themselves, given the difficulty that they've been having. I wondered about that word, presumptive nominee. I mean, so I can claim I'm the presumptive nominee, even if I haven't gotten the majority of delegates, by this standard that that if you just have the most delegates of everybody, that makes you presumptive. Right? Well, I think I think it's I think it goes beyond that. I think that's part of it, but I think it is uh, a recognition on the part of the party that he is inevitable at this point. Now, you know, he he thought they should have treated him better back in March when he was on a winning streak. That didn't happen for all the reasons we know about the questions about his, you know, his qualification and his knowledge and whether he would take the party to a big loss. Um, but they are hoping that if they can have a big night in, in New York and other states as we go forward, that the party establishment in the ways that Jennifer again was talking about of kind of build those bridges, that people begin to coalesce. What do you make, Jennifer, of, of Trump's tone change a little bit moving towards being presidential? Is that happening? Right. So a month ago, he tried to do that, and then everything fell apart. And so a month ago, you know, everyone was saying, OK, we think he is going to be inevitable, so we all need to live in that Trump world, and let's learn to accept it and, and work with him. And then uh, that just disappeared. But, uh, you know, people are starting to advise him start off at square one again. Go back to your original policy ideas where you're talking about, you know, the wall, national security, health care, you know, cleaning up Washington, D.C. Other people are saying, quit the Twitter addiction. Just stop now. If you're not going to do it when you're president, just quit tweeting now. And then really focus on the scoreboard and, and start racking up those delegates. But one thing about Cruz, he doesn't get enough credit for this with all this delegate wrangling, is it shows what a great micro organizer his team is and his, his strategy to say that, you know, that shows that he could be a really great general election candidate because he really knows how to, right. to organize and excite. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you. Coming up next, PBS filmmaker Ken Burns previews his latest project, Jackie Robinson.